Welcome everybody, what a privilege it is to be here and to talk about Betty Celia Barnard. Betty Celia Barnard is one of our most well-known South African and international successful artists. Of course, there are many more um, that have also painted during the Boer War and her contemporaries. Now, Betty Celia Barnard has an interesting style. Her, her career ranged for 75 years to 80 years, a productive um, artistic career. And she was, some people say, she was lucky enough to have been, to have reached her heyday in the apartheid era, because that means that she had more opportunities to exhibit. But unfortunately, during those days, we also had sanctions and um, all her opportunities overseas to be able to um, exhibit and to trade was also hampered. If you can see on your screens, illustration of one of her paintings. That painting is about two meters high and one and a half meter wide. It is an illustration of a painting that, uh, that is a real painting. It's uh, um, in Rassenburg High School in the headmaster's office. It used to hang in the foyer of Rustenburg High School. Rustenburg High School um, just celebrated 100, 100 years birthday and she was one of the first matriculants at that school. She painted this specially for the school and what this one symbolizes are many of this main, the main characteristics of Betty Celia Barnard's art. For many people her art is very ununderstandable because of it being very abstract. But as we proceed, you will probably, um, I, will, I will teach you how to look at her art and to appreciate it. Betty Celia Barnard was about five feet two. She was a petite, petite lady. And for her to paint these paintings was um, a physical feat. She had to stand on little chairs, um, ladders, and paint with, what she painted with mostly was palette knives, the foot and the edge and the floor of the palette knife. And she managed to do it so well that the burnishing and the textures were done with the palette knife. So she never varnished her paintings. So Elizabeth Petronella Bella Barnard was born on the 18th of November in 1914 on the farm Excelsior, which is in Moderfontein, which is on the northerly slopes of the Michalisberg near the Bushveld complex. She died in 2010 in Miller Park in a house of Victoria, right adjacent to Walter Pattis' house. Um, just after her 71st solo exhibition at the University of Pretoria. Many people describe her art as figurative abstraction, but her main forte was, she was the doyen of lithographic techniques in South Africa. Many of these lithographic techniques, lithographic means stone, graphic means um, to draw, um, was etchings that was made with sulfuric acid out of um, a softish marble, like limestone, and um, certain areas were covered with the top of a resin, and then a drawing was made, and then etched, and then one could ink it and print it. And she could print it three or four times, and each one was considered an original. Here's a picture of Betty in her house in Miller Park. There's one, there she's sitting with her poodle. There's an illustration, there's a beautiful painting of one of her large art paintings, art oil paintings, showing you her typical technique. She grew up in Moderfontein. She was one of seven children. And she went and studied and she trained. Uh, there are pages and pages full of training. She, w she could speak French, German, um, English, and Dutch fluently. Her mother was a music teacher. And um, in, her, in their house as a child, there was a lot of music and a lot of books. Here's a picture of one of Betty Celia Barnard's most beautiful artworks, this one on the left. That one's called The Guardian Angel of the Arts, and it's, it was hanging in the State Theatre in Pretoria. It's approximately three meters high and two meters wide. 
I don't know where it is now. And the elements there, um, I will explain to you again, are mainly the human elements, some bird elements, arrows, faces, some organic element, elements, trees. Of course, her, word, her works were taken up in many private collections and corporate collections. Sassel, Apsa, Konrad Strauss, um, she was always neat and friendly. Here's Betty in her studio, busy with a large, large work, which is typical of her work. Her studio was on the second floor of her house. Betty said she always painted at night. She said, because the night doesn't have shadows. You know, when we train as artists, we all learn to to, to um, paint very realistically. We start with still lives, portrait studies. We have to go to museums and sit there and illustrate exactly what you see. According to scale, we do a lot of art history. But then at a certain stage in a well-developed artist character, character, you develop your own style. And Betty very soon developed her own style, which is so characteristic that one can actually recognize it anywhere in the world at a fleeting glance. Betty always said that when you paint, what you paint and the structure of what you paint and the form, that is art. Planning your artwork, that's art. But when you come to the colors, the colors of puyetis, the word she used was puyetis, which means it's poetic. Because when you put the color in, then you are giving a certain energy and a certain meaning and a visually pleasing um, result to your painting. Also, Peter van Heerden, a lot of the creators, uh, curators of the largest museums in South Africa, she, she was in a pain in the ass because um, in certain aspects. She, when, she, when you have an art gallery and you're curating an art exhibition, um, the artists sometimes are quite involved in well, how they want it, how high they want it, and where they want to put their artworks. And Betty insisted on hanging it all herself, placing them in certain positions, adjusting the light, and um, often, and more often than not, they had to change the, the nails and readjust and s completely change the whole exhibition until she was happy. So, Betty painted at night. She worked in the day. She was t a teacher herself. She studied at Tucky's. I don't know if I've put that on already. And then she, took, she did further studies overseas and various, various um, um, training. What you see here is an aerial photograph fr taken from Google Earth of the Machalisberg circular range, with the, the north uh, showing south, and then the Pilansberg complex. And that arrow that I put there is that area, that whole area is Moderfontein. Now, Moderfontein, the Bushveld Igneous complex, is in this area, this ashtray, this ashtray that is the mines. And the Machalisberg is the old quartzite, three million years old ocean floor with the ripples. And then the Bushveld Igneous complex um, pushed it down, the, the whole lot of minerals, and it caused this tilt in the Michalisberg ranges. So, the Moderfontein farm here, um, the quartzite and the different types of conglomerates is a natural fountain, it causes natural fountains of water that, in, uh, that comes out in flowing streams all of the time. When her grandfather moved to um, from Montague to Rustenburg, that area is where Moderfontein is, and this is where I'm walking. Yeah, I like walking. So from Khashwane, that is where Moderfontein is, that's Olifant's neck. 
the minerals weren't um, di discovered yet. In fact, in her whole lifetime, they never um, could actually, they didn't know about the minerals. And by the time that they did, the farm was so subdivided, as all of the Afrikaner people do, they subdivide their properties to such an extent that everything is not economically viable anymore. And they sell off rights. And Betty had one routine, and she was a very disciplined woman, a friendly woman as well, and that she had at 12 o'clock noon, she had to have a double gin and tonic. And if she did not have that double gin and tonic at 12 o'clock noon, all the routines and everything would fall apart. So I'm sure that this specific, this two and a half by two and a half meter painting of um, Betty, um, she made specially to illustrate that gin. <laughs> but that's not the right glass because um, Betty took it in a long thin glass with a little bit of lemon and Indian tonic. Betty's maiden name was Conrad. She wasn't, no. Her father was Barnard. Her mother was a Conradi, and it's due to the fact that her mother was a Conradi that she landed up with that farm. That farm was um, inherited through the generations. Um, now, Betty's mother, as I said, was a school teacher in Pretoria, and she met Betty's father, Johannes Barnard, who was a furniture maker who came, from, came to Pretoria from Carnarvon. He came and worked in Pretoria, and that's where he met Betty's mother. So Johan, her mother was Johanna, and the father was Johan Barnard. And when Betty's um, mother inherited that farm in Moderfontein, which was a large citrus farm, tobacco farm, they moved to Rustenburg. That is now her mother. And that is where they stayed, and they drove with ox wagons, trippies, um, tre treppies in donkey car, in parakar, on dirt roads all along. Okay. Betty as a child recalls, recalls many visits to the ruins of the original family home. They had picnic on Sundays under a big wild fig tree that still stands there. The original family farm, I, I, I'm reading just like you, was bought in 1856. It was a three foot thick wool doubled gable home that was built at Moderfontein by her great-grandfather Francois Valhalmus Conradi. He was also, he changed his name, he changed it to Franz. And then he came with his wife Aleta, Regina, Dorothea, Francina, who was, and she was also a, a French lady, Rue, uh, from the Huguenot um, people, and they came to Rustenburg. And they came and they bought, they heard about the rich soils here. And that is that grandfather, great-grandfather of hers who actually bought the farm. And they followed in the footsteps of the Groot Trek. Now, this is a photo that I took on Monday. Here it shows the stones that the old house was built in. It's a three-foot thick quartzite quartzite stones. And then here's a symbol. This is after it, it was burnt down in the Boer War. It was burnt down in the Boer War and all the women were taken and the f parents were taken to Salon. And remember, Betty was born in 1915. So this was just 15 years prior to her birth that, that this place was still standing as a house. But in the runes, uh, there was a, a in the runes there was a wild fig, and it um, just grew and grew and grew. And when the house was burned down, it survived and it grew even more. And these um, rocks on the top are actually part of the solder, the sol solder um, on the top. So these are this is an illustration of um, what inspired Betty. Here are some wild fig um, leaves. Here are some trees. And then these birds that symbolize clouds or something spiritual. And then always these um, human profiles. At a stage in her life, she stopped with that. She stopped putting in the human factor. This is a picture of her Oma, Aleta, Regina, Dorothea, Francina, Rue, 
who was born in 1829, a Huguenot, and she died in 1901. And by that time they were really living here. And they had 11 children. These Conradis were very fertile, um, of which one of the sons was then Betty's father, Alvain. When they came here, they cultivated every imaginable vegetable, citrus, tobacco, and they sold it. They sold it, um, macadamia nuts. They even planted acorn trees, or oak, oak trees, um, avocado pears, and all kinds of things. It was a, basically, a, these were people that, are, that were farmers. And her father partook in the siege of the British garrison under Captain, um, I think Pet will be able to say that word much better, during the, South, the first South African war. Okay, that is in the first one, 1881. During the outbreak of the Second World War, 1899 to 1902, the original farmhouse and stables in the blacksmith area was burned down in the scorched earth policy. The women were deported to concentration camps in Pietermaritzburg and Krugersdorp, and the men sent to Salon and St. Helena. That's the result, if you look on the right, the result of that painting that she was painting in the studio that I showed you earlier. And then you can also see this painting comprises a lot of different paintings and elements. And next to that is a letter that was written in Hawick. This is a letter written from one lady in a concentration camp to another lady in a concentration camp up here in Irini, explaining that they had, it was a good day, they had some brood and they had some mutton and the women were staying on the other side a little bit further than the, the other people and that they could walk to and fro and that they were still fine. Here we can see the, the the thick walls, and then it's been rebuilt and re. That's not the same one. But it's just a little, two, 20 meters from there. Some of the old bricks that they've used through the ages to rebuild, and then other houses were then changed for slagkamers and stuff. But it's interesting here when I read. When they came back, I don't know how many of you understand Afrikaans, but um, these are the words of one of the neighbors that came there. Armede, honger en ontbering was onbeskryflik. Een boer het het so uitgedruk, ons het niks gehad om mee te ploeg nie, nie eers een kat nie. Now, if you look at these paintings, and you scrutinize these paintings, there are certain elements that keep repeating in these paintings. These paintings are huge. The one... Um, on this side, it's one and a half by one and a half meter, and this one's even larger. And then what we see is again the same elements, trees, arrows, some order, maybe some crosses. These look like bones or trees, and then sweeping flat lines of the application of a paint, and then Obviously, the color use. In 1914, the year that Betty was born, okay, the First World War broke out in Europe, as well as the Boer Rebellion. I quote from a centenary booklet of Franz Conradi on page 11. Die boere generaals Bayers de Wet en de La Rai het gehoop om weer die republikese vrijheid terug te win, maar hulle is gestuid dier die Britse boetis Louis Bota en Jan Smits. Now, a lot of these Conradis, being from German and um, French and Dutch descent, Korn, um, the, the main, it was Conradi when they, before they came to South Africa. They arrived in South Africa, her predecessors, in 1710. But before then, Kun mean like Konang or a master, and Rod is like a gathering. But when they came to South Africa, they changed the name to Conradi. Okay, here's Betty sitting in a graphic studio in Paris. These are some lithographed paints, lithographic paint, 
paintings there, the stones. I will explain to you later how that works. And then here is one of her paintings again. And what do we see? We see the triangular shape, the round shape, a little bit of organic shape, a few small elements, yeah, and colored beautifully in flat areas with the back of a palette knife, very precise. There are no loose brush strokes in her work. This is the high school Ru Rustenburg, so we're going back or forward, I don't know. Okay, she got, um, qualified with a um, distinction in mathematics. And she wanted to be, in those, in those days, Betty, her father and her family were well-to-do family. They were not poor. They were very successful farmers and they were very innovative. So Betty went to study at the University of Pretoria. She, she, she decided to study languages because she was good at that and she did major in, th in two languages. But um, there was a combination of choice, uh, um, subject choices which made her accidentally study history of art. And that is when also she decided to become an artist. And one can always think that there is a mathematical um, aspect to her art if you look at it. She met Bags Salia, Hendrik Johannes Christoffel Salia, there. He was working at Tuckies. And he, were, he eventually became quite big in Northern Transvaal rugby circles. And they had two be beautiful children. The one was called Jana Salia, she was an actor. And then her son, Vimkar. You can see Betty with her husband in their house. And on the right, Jana and Betty. Betty's scrawny little body with all the paints packed out. Very, very neat studio. Diligent, productive artist. Here she is in Paris, um, in one of her many journeys there, printing her unique, her unique lithographic prints um, from stone onto Fabriano or Schuller paper, I think it was Schuller. And each one was different because you had she could you could ink it and print it, and then re-ink it and print it, and then re-ink it and print it, and then recolor it in later. And um, when you look at these lithographic prints, and there are some elements in her art that keep repeating, of course. You'll have the cross. You'll have some concentric rings. And there'll be some symbolism. She was quite daring. In those, eight, in those days, people were painting chocolate box paintings. Chocolate box paintings are the little paintings that are so realistic realistic that they put it on chocolate boxes. Okay. So yeah, yes, she's studying at Antwerp and then also the graphic studios in Paris. In those days, being the Union of South Africa, many South Africans who had the opportunity got onto a, a passenger liner and they went and studied overseas or they at least worked overseas because it was the Union of South Africa and it was part of our culture to um, get an education um, overseas if you were lucky enough to be able to afford it. Okay, so yeah, what we see is we see human figures on your left hand side as part of a whole and individual human profiles, human figures as part of a whole, and then in groups, family groups. Her, f her lifetime after the first war spanned the establishment of the formation of the Union of South Africa, the Great Depression, the establishment of the Republic of South Africa, the Second World War, all with the blow yet and the roi yet. Also, she was part of the referendum in 1991, the first democratic election, 1994, the new dispensation under President Mandela. She experienced the turn of the century, and she painted until she was 91. There are pages and pages of accolades of for Petit Celia Barnard, um, which just takes too much time to type. So. 
what I just can say that she had three honorary doctor's degrees. She was Dr. Bedisle Barnard. First one was at the Puch Strom University, second one from the Rans Afrikaans Universiteit, and then quite recently, um, relatively speaking, an honorary doctor degree at uh, Alma Mater, the University of Pretoria. If we look at this painting of hers, what we see again, we see the human being as a cross, you see the birds, you see some personal um, representations, simple representations of human beings, some landscapes, some hills. Describing her art modernistic, Fauvist, Fauvism is a modern um, description that was used for color. Um, Fauvism means that if I paint green, it doesn't mean it's green. So Betty was once on a boat with Picasso, a passenger liner, accidentally, and she was traveling. And they were experimenting with different colors and different meanings and shapes. And her being of a mathematical background, um, she immediately um, adopted that ideology of not painting realistically or using realistic paintings. Angular and round, her themes were emotive and highly symbolic. She tried to demonstrate the cosmos as a life source, the symbolism of everlasting light within, without any shadows. You will never find a painting of Betty Celia Barnard, apart from the ones that she made in the beginning as part of her art degree, with, which is still lives and portrait studies, which we all had to do, that has shadows on. In the 80s, um, Betty started painting mandalas. In those days, there weren't any computerized graphic um, opportunities like we have. I've read a bit about the mandalas. For me, in the beginning, they were very um, decorative. I saw them as a decorative thing. I painted a few myself, and as the rings concentrically started radiating, um, one sometimes in the design you run into a dilemma here. The first dilemma is sometimes in the middle, and the next dilemma is in the end, and then fitting it in. That's another dilemma when you paint mandalas. What we, what we see when you look at this mandala, we see organic elements in the green. We see the organizational cross in the middle. And her crosses weren't always square like that. They were sometimes Greek crosses, the Jewish crosses, three-starred crosses, uh, that irrelevant. Her fantastic use of color, all with the sides of a palette knife. And then the perfectly measured concentric thorns around the edges, the arrows, which um, weren't symmetrical, but still falls very well on the eye. Now there is, I, I did write there about Carl Jung, what he said about the mandala, talking about the center, the urge to fulfill a potential, to make sense of a pattern of our whole personality. The central point, within the psyche, whether it's to the outside or to the inside, and everything is related, everything is arranged, and which is in itself a source of energy. Other things we see in Betty Celia Barnard's paintings is the triangular shapes, which for her symbolizes not just the Holy Trinity, but also the apex relationship of the human condition to a spiritual God. Arrow shapes, You'll see arrow shapes everywhere, showing not necessary direction. Sometimes I think they were just there as a geometrical shape or maybe as to, to symbolize a crossroad, having traveled so much. Birds, like clouds, symbolic of peace, nature, flight. Trees in all shapes echoes her appreciation of nature, their branches, their branches and stems she touched the transpiration that occurs in the leaves and the municipal capillaries through which the transpiration takes place. Then 
not in the specific one, but this, this one's quite biblical, but in some of the other ones, you'll see always the portal, an arch, human figures as symbolic of the individual in itself or part of the whole, the cross she uses as a symbolism for cosmic order, personal hieroglyphics. That is very interesting because she um, used some things that reminds of archaeological pictographs, arrow shapes, biblical themes, but she made them their own. She did not copy any um, of the petroglyphs or ethnographs or anything that was used by other cultures. This painting that you see on your left hand side is four and a half by four and a half meter. That's Miller Balot, the author of the book Bediselia Barnard, from whom I've taken just about all of these images. At the Sassel exhibition, where she's standing at the bottom, huge um, paintings, simply framed, um, ex explaining her uh, art. And okay, if we go back, we see this orange one. There's again this arrow, squares, more arrows to the sides, and then these squares like a, like a, like in the in the corners, and then raindrops. Okay, so when it comes to lithography, lithography is a print. It's a print that's made out of inked, an uh, inked slab of stone. What happened, Betty Celia Barnard um, lost the opportunity to actually import her stones anymore because of the sanctions. So John Clark, who was at Wits University, he was professor in art, he was assisted by geologists to get a substitute for the um, marble. So they got, in Amakwa, they got a nice stone, which simulated marble, but it's a little bit softer, a little limey, more. And good quality paper that they made in South Africa, and the gum Arab Arabic they um, got from acacia trees. Her oil paintings were very large, they were hand-stretched. She always had them done by Emil Schweikert. Um, she had all her framing done there, and she also, Emil also, Import, he was an artist himself. He started the Schweikert's art um, uh, um, shops. All the art uh, paints was also imported at a, quite a long, big cost. Now this is Monday. Um, at the top there you see my friend with whom it's meaningless doing um, field work. Piet. Any field work without Piet is meaningless. And then the Rieta Geiser, who is a descendant of um, a cousin of Betty, and there also some of the runes that have been shot at the bottom of the old houses, and then the terrain of the bushveld at the lower slopes where she grew up. Her contemporaries were Schweikert von Wau, Kurt Steinberg, Scottness, Maggie Lobscher, Ismay Berman, who wrote a nice book about her, Stephen Walsh, Dirk Meerkotter. Okay, and then there's another painting of her at the top left, which is hanging in the high school Rustenburg as well, which is a lithograph of the high school colors um, uh, uh, illustrating a flag. And there's Linka, her granddaughter, Betty and Jana. And on the right, that's my granddaughter, Hanna, sleeping in the front foyer of high school Rustenburg. And that on the top is an illustration of that fantastic school which in the time when she was there, about 20 years later, was the biggest school in, in Transvaal. It had more than 1,300 students already. These are the rock pools on Betty Celia's um, farm. This is where the water originates out and comes down, and then it gets distributed by means of pipes and some leading, uh, the Luxman, Walter Luxman. There's also a beautiful sunset. That's the type of sunset that you would have seen over the quartzite and the Stamfrig. Okay, then I'd just like to say in Afrikaans, wanneer ek my kinderjaar in verband wil bring met my kinds, dan herinner ek myself dat ek uit die staanspoor dinge rondom my besonder goed waargeneem het. 
Daar was niet een boom op die plaats waarvan ik die stam en die blaren niet goed gekend het nie. Daar was niet een zonsondergang wat mij niet beindruk nie. Het nie. Ek onthou ek elke aand vir aand, toe ek so 8, 9 was, vir die sonsondergang aan gewag het, die, hoe die kleren en die tekstiere verander. So here I am standing in front of this painting, and if you want to, you can look for the mandala, you can look for the triangular shapes, the birds and the trees, the painting that she painted for her high school. You can see the screw-like shapes that symbolizes the mines, because she made it much later, drilling into the earth, the organic center, this, the cross symbolizing order, the mandala with a portal, wind pumps, a geographical area symbolizing the subdivision of farms, and then also the soft, soft colors. Okay. I think I don't have any more jokes, so thank you for listening to me.